Kevin, you're on. Thank you, Chris. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first ever virtual Voyager lecture series. I would like to start by saying for half of you, I am probably screaming right now, and for the other half, I'm probably whispering. Please keep in mind that you'll have to make some adjustments to the audio on your end, and please keep that in mind as we move through the presentation. I would like to thank the staff and the volunteers at the Center for the Arts for making all of this possible. There's already a large amount of work that goes into putting on one of these productions, and that amount of work only increases when you add in layers of technology such as we're using right now. So thank you so very much. I'd also like to thank you in the audience for navigating that same technology um, and for tuning in this evening and for sharing part of your evening with us. We so appreciate it. My name is Kevin Rory. I'm with Voyager Wealth Advisors. We're the main sponsor for the Voyager Lecture Series. I'd also like to say thank you to our co-sponsors, State Farm Insurance Agent Sherry McGee and Shelley Harris with Cash Valley Bank. As we become more isolated and staying at home, it becomes so much more important for us all to remain connected and feel a really strong sense of community. Now that's long been the mission of the Kayanta Arts Foundation, and it's one of the many reasons why we continue to support them, now more than ever, to keep the lights on at the Center for the Arts. If any of you in the audience are interested in finding out how you can make a difference, I would encourage you to reach out to a board member, a volunteer, or a staff member. Ron Smith, uh, he kind of borders on the status of no longer requiring an introduction. However, for those of you tuning in who have not had the opportunity to hear him speak, you're certainly in for a treat. He's kind of a tough person to introduce because his body of knowledge is so wide that every time you do it, you're very likely to leave something out. <laughs> To give you the highlights, he has over 30 plus years of expertise in his field, which he calls planetarium education. He's given presentations at places like the Page Museum of Natural History, the Griffith Observatory, and he was also director of the Tessman Planetarium. And that's the short list. Now retired, Ron enjoys sharing his passion for science with audiences just like this. So without further ado, please give a warm virtual welcome to our speaker for the evening, Ron Smith. That uh, we had a little meeting a week ago on Zoom. And somebody mentioned during the Zoom meeting that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson said that Van Gogh's Starry Nights was the first astronomically inspired piece of art. And I have an enormous amount of respect for Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I'm sure it's true. So I thought there was no more appropriate way to begin than actually to show you the Starry Nights by Van Gogh. As it turns out, uh, art is vitally important. Uh, a lot of you might have had an interest in science because of reading Time Life magazine or perhaps Collier's magazine. Art is a way in which our imaginations can come to life. It's a way in which our imaginations can also be shared with others. So Van Gogh started a wonderful trend and we'll continue that tonight. I'm going to show you several pieces of art by Chesley Bonestell who back in the 1950s became a close friend with Werner von Braun and teamed up with Collier's Magazine, Life Magazine, and portrayed our adventure through the solar system through the eyes of an artist inspired by astronomy. So as it turns out, when you uh, look into the night sky, you uh, wind up seeing something different every time. In this particular view, there we go, uh, you might wonder, what is that bright star behind the clouds? It's the moon, occulted by the clouds, and the backlit gives us an interesting view. For those of you that have enjoyed the Cosmos series, both the new one as well as the original one by Carl Sagan, okay, you might remember that the Carl Sagan one said after Cosmos, a personal voyage. Well, I was inspired as a nine-year-old boy 
when my parents took me to the Griffith Observatory and I saw my first planetarium show. And I just knew that I wanted to lecture in the planetarium. Well, we don't have a dome here with the night sky. We don't have a planetarium in St. George. But with a little bit of imagination and with the benefits of pictures, it's possible for us to, in a sense, do a planetarium show that we did all the time, each season of the year. We tried to run a program in which we introduce the night sky and give you the highlights of what you can expect to observe over the next few months. So right now, let's enjoy a planetarium show inspired by the appearance of the spring sky. Now, that should not be there. Now we're going back and back and back. Okay. Uh, a lot of you have probably noticed, if you look in the west in bright twilight, and certainly when it's dark, there is something extraordinarily bright out there. Very, very bright. It almost seems unnatural. Some people think it might be a plane with its landing lights. Some people think it could be a missile from North Korea. But <laughs> it's not. It's the planet Venus. Other than the moon or the sun, Venus is the brightest object in our night sky, if we just talk about natural objects. Now, somebody called me up two weeks ago. They said that they were looking at Venus, and they noticed something extraordinary. There seemed to be a cluster of faint stars that moved across the sky like satellites, but there were dozens of them. And I said, it must have been a fleet of alien aircraft. No, there is an explanation, and it's kind of bizarre. If you were to uh, go to some very remote area of the world, in many parts of Africa, the Sahara Desert, the Northwest Territories of Canada, or if you're out in the floating Petri dish at sea, why, you are cut off from a high-speed Internet connection. But no more. A company called Starlink is going to put up a network of over 10,000 low-orbiting satellites that will bring high-speed internet connection to all areas of the world, even out in the middle of the ocean. And so these are being launched now. They're being launched by SpaceX. That's the company, of course, that uh, Elon Musk has founded with the goal of putting men on Mars. As it turns out, they are now launching these satellites. And when you watch them being launched, why they're bright, and you can see what looks like a cluster of satellites. Uh, some astronomers are worried about this. Uh, we're going to have over 10,000 of these satellites. That will increase the number of low-orbiting satellites five-fold. What if one of them should collide with something? Well, the pieces would fly all over the place. And those pieces could cause collisions with other satellites. And then you get a chain reaction in which all of the satellites get knocked out. Uh, a NASA engineer by the name of Kessler talked about this. And it's called the Kessler effect. But not to be dismayed, uh, these satellites come with a collision avoidance system. Well, you would expect that from the builder of Tesla. So there you go. Uh, it probably will work out OK. But if you see uh, a strange number of satellites moving in formation, as Paul Harvey would say, now you know the rest of the story. So for some reason, this thing is advancing on its own. I don't know what's happening here. OK. Now we'll go back uh, a little uh, deeper into the twilight. Have you ever noticed that all the time when you have deep twilight, the sky appears red. And there's a reason for this red sky. And the reason is fairly simple. The Earth's atmosphere acts like a filter. And the light we see of different colors is because light can be modeled as a wave. And light comes in a variety of wavelengths. The shorter wavelengths appear blue. A little bit longer, green. A little bit longer, yellow. And then orange. And the longest ones appear red. This seems to have a mind of its own. And what I'm going to do is stop this and start it all over again. I probably pressed the wrong button.
and we'll get this thing not on the mode where it's advancing itself. But the red sky is simple. The Earth's atmosphere is filled not only with atoms of air, but it's also filled with fine particles of dust. It turns out that as the light passes through the atmosphere, the fine particles interfere and reflect blue light more effectively than red light. That's why the sky appears blue, because blue light is scattered more effectively by dust than red light. So when the sunlight is on a path near sunset or sunrise, when the light passes through more of the Earth's atmosphere, more of this filtering takes place. The blue light is removed, and then eventually what we find is that only the red light gets through. So that's the reason why in the early morning at sunrise, or as evening comes on, we have red sunsets and red sunrises. And sometimes you even notice the red color very, very easily, simply because we have a lot of dust in the atmosphere, and that dust is very, very good at filtering. So here we go. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Uh, can you really see Pluto with your naked eye? No, you can't, uh, only with a little bit of imagination. But this reminds us something, and maybe it's an inspiration for all of us to look up. It's very, very simple. As it turns out, because we're engaged in less transportation, less automobiles, less factories, less airplane, the skies are clearing up. And people in many areas of the world, beset by pollution, are now seeing better skies. So maybe that should inspire us to take a look at the night sky, but not Pluto. Pluto, as it turns out, is very faint. And if you have a telescope, you need a telescope with a mirror or a lens about 12 inches in diameter to just barely be able to see it. Those are fairly heavy and fairly expensive. So what about the planet Venus, that bright object that we're seeing in the evening sky? If you were to photograph Venus with a telephoto lens, particularly a small telescope, you would see it's in a crescent phase. Venus goes through phases, just like the moon. And it's easy to see when we simply look at the relative position of Venus compared to the Earth. Now notice that Venus is in an orbit around the sun that is inside the orbit of the Earth. So at times, Venus can be on the far side of the sun. And when it's on the far side of the sun, the sunlight side will face the sun, but also Earth at the same time. So we see a full Venus. As Venus moves through its orbit and comes between the Earth and the sun, look what happens. When it's nearly between the Earth and sun, most of the sunlit side faces the sun. The Earth is in the opposite direction. Therefore, we only see a thin sliver of its lighted side. Now you're probably saying, I need a telescope to see this. But you don't. Notice that when Venus is in the crescent phase, it's closest to Earth, and the crescent is large. An ordinary pair of binoculars, just seven or eight power, and you can easily see the crescent Venus. So there's your homework tonight. When all this is over with and you go home, take out those binoculars and look at the planet Venus, and you will see that Venus goes through phases. Galileo was the first to observe this because he was the first to use a telescope for astronomical viewing. Galileo noted that Venus and Mercury, which Copernicus said orbited the sun and were closer to the sun than the earth, would go through phases. And Galileo was able to see the phases of Venus. Now what about Mars? Well, Mars, of course, is beyond the earth and so is Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. Notice that Mars cannot somehow sneak out of its orbit and crawl between the Earth and the Sun. When Mars is on the far side, we see all of its lighted side. And when Mars is here, it gets illuminated by the Sun, and then that sunlight is reflected back to Earth. We see all of its lighted side. Mars does not go through a full set of phases. So Galileo noted that Copernicus placing the sun at the center, 
and the planets orbiting the sun predicted that Venus would go through phases. His observation showed that that was the case. But if you place the Earth at the center of the solar system, this would not occur. So Galileo was able to affirm observational proof of the Copernican theory. And this is, in a sense, in many ways, the birth of modern science, where rather than just believing something because Aristotle said so, or believing something because it was taught to us wherever the source may be, instead we can learn by observation and experiment. That's the heart of the scientific method. Make a proposal. Make a model that explains what we might see, and then observe and confirm that model. So we owe a lot to Galileo, and Galileo saw the value right away in observing the phases of Venus. What is Venus like? The artist Chesley Bonestell painted this around 1960. Now, we had no idea what Venus was like in 1960. We knew it was closer to the sun than Earth, and therefore would probably be warmer. We also knew that Venus had clouds, and that when you look at it through a telescope, no matter when you look at it, it's perpetually covered in clouds. There's never any break in those clouds. So this implied that the atmosphere was fairly thick, probably warm, and perpetually cloudy. But what were the clouds? Chesley Bonestell envisioned that perhaps Venus was a hot, dry world, and the clouds were perpetual clouds of dust. Some people speculated that maybe the clouds were water clouds, that Venus was warm and tropical, and that it may have had climates like the Earth had in the past. Well, we didn't know. It was all speculation until the mid-1960s, when balloon launches followed by spacecraft, finally determined that the clouds of Venus were part of a very thick atmosphere, an atmosphere at an elevation of 40 miles that had the same density as the Earth's atmosphere, an atmosphere that on the surface would have an air pressure almost 100 times greater than we experience on Earth, and an atmosphere that was exceedingly warm. The clouds of Venus were not dust, were not water vapor, but clouds of sulfuric acid. But it never rains on the surface. The sulfuric acid evaporates long before hitting the ground because the surface temperatures of Venus are 875 degrees on the Fahrenheit scale. So they often say that because Venus is the closest planet to Earth, it's not only closest in distance, but closest in size, we call it the Earth's twin. But as Carl Sagan says, it's more like the Earth's twin sister from hell. This is a very hot, inhospitable environment as far as life is concerned. About three weeks ago, if you looked at the planet Venus in the evening sky, you might have noticed that as twilight darkens, you can see a V-shaped cluster of stars down and to the left, and a very small dense cluster of stars down and to the right. These are real star clusters, groups of stars that we think form together in space and move through space in the same speed and direction. This famous group is called the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters, and it's about 420 light years away. This cluster, because it's larger, might imply that it's closer to us, and that's exactly the case. It's called the Hyades Cluster, and it's about 140 light years away. Uh, a week earlier, Venus and the Pleiades were very, very close. So this picture I took with a 400 millimeter lens. I stopped it down, and the iris gave those spikes when the camera was stopped down to f16. And here you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stars of the Pleiades, or seven sisters. Well, Venus has moved away from the Pleiades and Hyades, but it's still out there. And of course, if you look at it with binoculars, you can see that crescent face. Notice that if you look off way to the left of Venus, 
there is perhaps the brightest, most famous constellation in all the sky. Does anybody recognize these three stars, these two, and these two? That's Orion, the hunter. The two stars here represent his shoulders. Here is his head. Three stars for a belt, a sword from his belt, and two stars for the knees. Orion is a constellation. And a constellation is nothing more than a gathering or grouping of stars. Orion may be the most famous constellation, but there's another one that rivals it. The Big Dipper. And here you can see the Big Dipper is close to the North Star, Polaris. If we extended the Earth's axis into space, it would nearly point to this star. And as the Earth rotates, the sky to us seems to move around that star. And during the springtime, in the early evening, the Big Dipper is high in the sky above the star Polaris. Later in the summer, it's off to the left. And then in the early evening in the fall, it hugs the horizon. And finally, as winter comes on, it's to the right. This would be the position of the Dipper in the early evening sky. But I've made a terrible mistake here. The Big Dipper is not really a constellation. The real constellation is called Ursa Major, the Great Bear. The Big Dipper is simply the seven brightest stars within this larger constellation. So what is a constellation? Well, it's nothing more than a gathering of stars, but that gathering of stars is made by us. It's not a real cluster of stars in space. The stars are not physically connected together. In fact, we can use the Big Dipper to illustrate this. Even though when you look into the sky and you see the patterns of stars that we call the constellations, they stay fixed in position for all your life. Well, that's because our naked eye is not very powerful, and we're not going to see individual star motions in a human lifetime. But through a telescope, we can measure very small motions. And we've been able to determine the motions of the stars of the Big Dipper. And notice that five of them pretty much move in the same speed and direction, but two others move almost in the opposite direction. Those stars are at different distances, and they're not moving together in space like the Pleiades or the Hyades, true star clusters. So constellations are part of our imagination. They're groups of stars that we have constructed. And they are useful. As it turns out, astronomers are familiar with the constellations because they use them as a way to locate other objects in the sky. If you own a telescope, if you know the constellations, the constellations can guide you to point your telescope at interesting objects in the evening sky. Here is that group of stars that we call the Big Dipper. If I draw a line through these two stars and point it, oh, about five times the length between those two, you point to Polaris, the North Star. But now let's do something different. Let's draw a diagonal line through the bowl. And you notice that there is a group of objects there. These are galaxies that are found in a star chart as we see here. Let's take a look at those galaxies. They are known as Holmberg 9, M81, and M82. So what in the world are these romantic galaxy names, M81, M82? Well, if you look at these through a telescope, let me go back to the previous view. Vibgur ridden it. We just backed up. <laughs> Okay, uh, notice that uh, those objects are very, very small, and in a binocular or low-power telescope view, they don't look that impressive. They look like little smudges of light. And if you see little fuzzballs of light, comets look like that. And a French astronomer by the name of Charles Messier in the 1700s was fascinated by comets fascinated by the night sky. 
he found dozens of comets in his lifetime. And he also cataloged objects in the sky that could be confused with comets. So M82 and M81 were in his catalog in which he would announce to the world and to you and I, look, fellas, these are not comets. Now, how did he know that they were not comets? Well, comets are objects in our solar system. They move through orbits like the planets. And planets change positions. And so do comets, because they're close to us, and we see that change of position. But galaxies are very far away, so far away that we don't see them change position. So he was cataloging the sky to help comet hunters not confuse objects with comets. Turns out that the 110 objects that he cataloged, actually he didn't catalog all 110, but most of them, uh, they are interesting star clusters, galaxies, and nebulae or gas clouds. They are what amateur astronomers find to be the most interesting objects in the sky. But they're not comets. They're galaxies. And Holmgren 10 or 9 is a dwarf galaxy. The big galaxies in the Milky Way, the galaxy we live in is a big galaxy, dominate the night sky. But we find that dwarf galaxies are very common. Have any of you been in the Southern Hemisphere? If so, you may have seen the clouds of Magellan, two puffs of light that you can see with the naked eye. They were first noted by the explorer Magellan as he returned to Europe. Uh, he didn't personally return. He was killed by cannibals in Indonesia. But he did note these clouds. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate, but it happens. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, he did note these clouds, and his captain's log, uh, they decided in his honor that they would call them in his name, the Clouds of Magellan. They are dwarf galaxies close to the Milky Way, but they're near the South Celestial Pole, so you have to travel near the equator or into the Southern Hemisphere to be able to see them. So we see dwarf galaxies all over the place, and there are a lot of them. They're more common than the giant galaxies, but a little bit more difficult to see. Now, what I want to show you now is a constellation map. We're showing the Earth. The north polar axis would point to Polaris. South polar axis would point to the south celestial pole. And this is a constellation called Fornax. It's not that far from Orion. It's kind of below Orion and to the east of Orion. But this is a boring part of the sky. If you were to take an amateur's telescope and look at Fornax, there's nothing to see. There's no galaxies, no star clusters. It's thought to be an area that's just not very interesting. So out of curiosity, we decided to take the Hubble Space Telescope, point it at an area in Fornax where we thought nothing existed, and expose for hours and hours and hours. And this is what we found. Wow, there's a lot there. This is the famous Hubble Deep Field. This is an area of the sky where we thought nothing existed. And nearly every image that you see there is a galaxy. We now realized that the number of galaxies across our entire cosmos was probably at least tenfold more than we had ever imagined. Now think about this. Let's go back a hundred years in time. In 1920, there was a meeting of the American Astronomical Society. And at that time, we had seen the objects like M81 and M82, those two galaxies, but we didn't view them as clusters of stars very far away. We thought that they were nebulae or clouds of gas nearby in our own galaxy. But there was an astronomer by the name of D.H. Curtis, who made a bold assertion. He said that when we look at these objects through a spectroscope, they seem to be a collection of stars, not gas. And he suggested that these were like our Milky Way galaxy, but so incredibly far away that they looked like fuzzy patches of light. Edwin Hubble later proved that this assertion was right, 
The most renowned astronomer of that time, 1920, was Harlow Shapley. And he believed that these were nebulae in our own galaxy. The two who reported on different points of view at this American Astronomical Society meeting got so heated up in an argument over this, they nearly came to physical blows. As it turns out, astronomers get ego involved in their work like everybody else. But what a startling thing was discovered in the 1920s, that our universe was not an island universe of a lot of stars that we call the Milky Way in a vast sea of nothing. The universe consisted of billions and billions of galaxies, and many of these galaxies are as vast or even bigger than our own Milky Way. And the Hubble Deep Field shows that there were even more galaxies than we had ever imagined. It goes to show you that the universe is not obliged to exist in a state that makes us feel comfortable. It is what it is, and we have to boldly simply look and lead where the evidence tells us to go. And the evidence is showing that the universe is vast indeed. And there are many things that might seem incredible to believe, but you never know. We've now looked at the evening sky, but we're going to switch views now and take a look at the morning sky. In this particular view, you can see three bright stars above the tree nebula. Well, no. <laughs> uh, most astronomers do not have a love affair with streetlights. But actually, photographically, they can be quite useful. You can photograph the night sky, and the streetlights can illuminate foreground objects and make for an attractive picture. Those objects are not stars, they're planets. The bright one is the planet Jupiter. Off to the left is Saturn, and below Saturn is the planet Mars. Uh, this picture was taken about a month ago. Now we're going to take a look at a picture that was taken two days after this. Do you notice a change? Yeah, uh, Mars was here, and now it's moved off to the left. Mars is much closer to us than Jupiter and Saturn, so its motions are seen more readily than the outer planets. So Mars and Venus and Mercury change position in the sky very, very rapidly. In fact, the very word planet comes from the Greek, and it means wanderer. These were the objects that moved against the background of stars. And we have seven days of the week. We had five planets visible to the naked eye. Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. And then, of course, we had the sun and the moon. So the seven days of the week were named after the seven natural objects that we see in the sky. And the planets do move. And you can see the motion of Mars very readily. Now we're going to take you to a picture that was taken just a couple of nights ago. Well, here you can see Jupiter, and there is Saturn. Where's Mars? It's over here. So it's moved quite a bit. It's moved about 25 degrees to the left. And if you're wondering, well, I can't visualize 25 degrees. Well, there is a way that you can measure degrees in the sky crudely, but it, it's an approximation. Take a fist and hold it at arm's length, and that fist will cover up an angle of about 10 degrees. So Mars has moved about two and a half fists off to the east or to the left as we see it in the morning sky. And this is the picture of the pre-dawn sky uh, looking to the southeast. Jupiter is almost due south now in the early morning sky. Saturn, of course, very close by. Mars more off to the east. What are these planets like? Let's take a look at each one of these. Here is just a view of the same thing all over again. Here we have Jupiter. Here we have Saturn. And there we have Mars. If you were to look at the planet Jupiter, you would see that it uh, is banded by clouds. And sometimes you can see little stars near Jupiter. Those stars seem to line up on a flat plane. And they are actually satellites or moons that were discovered by the astronomer Galileo. 
In fact, the four satellites are referred to as the Galilean satellites. And also you might notice a feature on Jupiter, if you have a telescope, that is a large red oval. Astronomers, with a great deal of imagination and ingenuity, have come to call this the Great Red Spot. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Now, uh, the Great Red Spot is interesting. Uh, there's about a 50% a chance you'll see it on any given night. Remember, Jupiter could be rotated around where it's facing away from you, so that's why you cannot see it all the time. But it's becoming increasingly difficult to see because what we're going to do now is compare Jupiter with how it appeared 100 years ago. Notice over 100 years ago, the red spot was much bigger. And over the past 20 years, this shrinkage of the red spot has perceived is, is increasing. So will it disappear? Well, first of all, what is it? As nearly as we can tell, the best model for the red spot is something like a hurricane. Now, on Earth, if you have the right conditions where you get a vortex or circular wind direction over a hot ocean, why the water will evaporate and form clouds. The clouds will form a ring around that central core of spin. And although it rains and the clouds would dissipate, they're reinvigorated by more moisture that evaporates. So as long as that low pressure system with rotating winds is over a warm ocean, Theoretically, a hurricane could last forever. And this is what we thought the red spot might be. And it may well be, because Jupiter is unlike the Earth. It doesn't have a vast, big, solid surface covered by a thin envelope of air. There's probably a core to Jupiter that is solid like the Earth, but that would only be about the size of the Earth. 90% of the diameter of Jupiter is gas and mostly hydrogen gas. And because of gravity, it's compressed into a liquid. Most of Jupiter is liquid hydrogen. Wonder if it prevents the coronavirus. <laughs> anyway, liquid hydrogen. And it's warm because gravity, of course, when it compresses gas, it adds energy to the gas and heats it. So what we see on Jupiter are really the tops of clouds. Underneath these clouds is a vast ocean, and that vast ocean might be warm enough to sustain storms like the red spot indefinitely. It's weakening now, but that might only be temporary. It's a big mystery. Will it continue to weaken? Will it dissipate away? Or will it come back? Well, you'll have to buy a telescope and observe Jupiter and see for yourself. This is Chesley Bonestell's painting of the planet Jupiter. He viewed himself on one of the inner moons, the moon Io, looking out across the planet. Now, when you look at the Earth's moon, you're looking at an object about a quarter of a million miles away, and it only covers up about a half a degree. If you're on Io, Io is about the same distance from Jupiter as the Earth's moon. And Jupiter, because it's bigger, would cover up over 20 degrees in the sky. It would appear more than 40 times larger than the Earth's moon. So that would be an impressive sight. And Chesley Bonestell tried to capture that. Now, what is this and this and this? You might think that since the red spot was called the great red spot, these are called the great dark spots. But they're not features in the atmosphere at all. These are shadows cast on Jupiter by the orbiting moons. So what would it be like if you could take an airplane and fly into those shadows in Jupiter's atmosphere? You would see a total solar eclipse as observed from the planet Jupiter. That would be an impressive sight. And I know people that if they could, they would love to go there to observe these eclipses. I would too, but it's a long journey. The crown jewel of the solar system is, of course, the planet Saturn. 
And Saturn, as seen through a small telescope, is pretty much as you view here. At the top might be a typical view, but with a powerful telescope and good stable conditions in the Earth's atmosphere, you might see Saturn as well as this lower view. Now notice that the rings of Saturn are actually greater across in diameter than the planet itself. What are these rings? How did they form? It is a great mystery that has finally been resolved. When you compare Saturn with Jupiter, Saturn is about twice as far away, so it appears about half the size. Jupiter and Saturn are roughly the same size as planets go. Jupiter is about 15% larger. But Saturn is nearly the size of Jupiter, but it's twice as far away. But the rings make Saturn appear about as large in a telescope as the planet Jupiter. Why does Saturn have rings? A French mathematician by the name of Rocher gave us a theoretical explanation that describes how the rings of Saturn may have been formed. Let's imagine that you took a body that was just a loose accretion, that means kind of a snowball gathering of particles, and let's make it little crystals of ice. So we have a big snowball of ice, and it comes close to Saturn. As it gets closer and closer to Saturn, you have to realize something. This part of that icy body is closer to Saturn than the far side. So gravity over here is stronger than the gravity over here. Saturn's attraction on this body is differential. It's stronger on the near side. It's weaker on the far side. And if this body came within 2.44 radii of Saturn away, Saturn has a diameter of about 80,000 miles, so its radius is 40,000 miles. 2.44 would be 40, 80, and then 0.4, let's just call it 20. So uh, if you're about 100,000 miles away from Saturn and you're just a loose accumulation of ice crystals, Saturn's gravity is going to tear these crystals away from the others and the object will be dispersed in the tiny pieces. So herein lies a theory as to how the rings formed. Perhaps one of the satellites of Saturn came within this distance and was pulled apart. Or perhaps a comet, which is known to be a dirty snowball, just a loose accretion or snowballing of ice, mostly water ice, by the way, it was torn apart and formed this ring system. But now you may ask, why Saturn? Why does only Saturn have rings? If this is the case, shouldn't other planets have rings? And the answer is, they do. Jupiter has a ring system, but the ring system as seen from Earth is edge on, and it can't be seen. It was the Voyager spacecraft that discovered the rings of Jupiter. Uranus have rings, but the rings of Uranus are very faint. They seem to be made of darker material and Uranus is twice as far away as Saturn. So through Earth-based telescopes, you can't detect them. We've even discovered that Neptune has rings. So all of the giant planets of our solar system have ring systems. So it confirms that Roche gave us a valuable insight as to why these rings are observed. Saturn has the brightest, most vastly complex ring system, but each of the outer planets has rings, and they all lie within Roche's limit. Chesley Bonestell drew this that probably gave us a better vision of astronomical art, and it launched his career. This is the planet Saturn, as seen from its large moon Titan. Titan is an interesting world. Even though it's smaller than the planet Earth or Venus or Mars, it's about the size of Mercury. It's about 3,000 miles across. And unlike other moons in the solar system, it holds an atmosphere 
if you could walk on the surface of Titan, the air pressure would be about 1.5 times greater than the air pressure on Earth. That would be about the same as going six feet underwater. That's very tolerable. This is the only world in the solar system where you would not need a pressure suit or a space suit to survive. You would need an oxygen mask. There is no free oxygen in the atmosphere of Titan. You would need down clothing because the average temperature is about 230 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. But Titan has a lot of similarities to the Earth. The atmosphere consists mostly of nitrogen, and that's the main ingredient of the Earth's atmosphere. The clouds of Titan are made up of droplets of liquid methane, which is natural gas on Earth. It turns out that methane on Titan exists in all three states just like water does on Earth. We know that water can exist as a liquid. We see it as oceans and lakes. We know that water can evaporate and be an invisible gas, water vapor. And we know that the water vapor can condense and form liquid droplets in the atmosphere for clouds. And we know that water can freeze and form snow or ice. So water on Earth can exist in the solid, liquid, and gaseous state. The air pressures and temperatures on Titan allow methane to exist in all three states. On Titan, we have found lakes of liquid methane. We have found clouds and droplets of liquid methane in the atmosphere. And we know that it snows liquid methane or solid methane on the surface. So perhaps the vision of Chesley Bonestell was quite remarkable. He predicted that we would find snow on the surface. He may have thought it might have been ice, and it is ice, but it's frozen methane, not frozen water. Frozen water does exist on Titan, and probably much of the crust of Titan, the surface you would walk on, is actually frozen water. But it's never warm enough for that water to ever melt. Uh, water will always be in the crystalline solid state of ice. Titan is a fascinating world. Could we see Saturn from Titan's surface? Probably only under rare circumstances. The atmosphere is cloudy, it's thick, and remember, uh, Saturn is far away and dimly lit by the sun. Saturn is 10 times farther from the sun than Earth, and it means the intensity of sunlight is only a hundredth as great. So Saturn would be large and dim, the atmosphere would be cloudy, and therefore Saturn would be a tough view. But boy, what a sight that would be to see Saturn with its rings from the moon Titan. There is one last planet that we must see in our morning sky. We've looked at Jupiter. We've looked at Saturn. Well, what about Mars? Now, if you really feel incapacitated about going into the night sky and finding anything, if you feel visually challenged by all of this, here is a surefire way to know what to do. On May 11th, the moon will appear to the right of Jupiter and Saturn. On May 12th, it will be below Jupiter and Saturn. And on May 14th, it will be fairly close to Mars, off just a little bit to the right. So if you want to find these morning objects, this can guide the way. Let the moon guide your way. So what does Mars look like through a telescope? Looks like this. Not particularly impressive. You can see kind of a ruddy orange colored atmosphere. You can see a white polar cap. And you can see dark areas that early astronomers thought were actually bodies of water. In fact, the big dark area that is right on the right limb over here is called Sirtis Major which actually means big swamp. It turns out that Mars is not easy to observe most of the time. The orbit of Mars, as you see here in the red, 
is noticeably elliptical or oval in shape compared to the Earth's near circular orbit. Now, well, I have the same problem where it's developing a mind of its own, but we'll just struggle with this. When Earth and Mars are closest together, they're about 35 million miles apart. That's about 125 times farther away than the moon. That's why it takes at least seven months to get to Mars, only several days to get to the moon. And not all close approaches to Mars are the same. This is the closest possible approach, about 35 million miles. But Mars can be as far away as nearly 65 million miles on a less favorable approach. Every two years and two months, the Earth and Mars line up. Think of the Earth as a runner on a track. Think of Mars as a slower runner on the outside. Every 2.2 Earth revolutions, and the Earth laps Mars and passes it. And that's when the two are close together. This is happening this year. Here is Mars as you see it now. In early October, it will be much, much larger. And that's when you might have a chance to view it well through the telescope. As you look at Mars, the features are subtle. This is Sirtis Major, the Great Swamp. But the prominent thing to see on Mars with the telescope, especially before October, is the southern polar cap. It's bright white and will be seen. Of course, we're interested in going to Mars. If Elon Musk makes a big profit from launching these satellites, he wants to go. And this is how Chesley Bonestell portrayed a first expedition to Mars. Now, he was influenced, of course, in the 1950s by Werner von Braun. And notice that the rocket looks like a V2. But the vision was still there. We realized that we would build rockets with the potential someday of going to the planet Mars. We realized that from the Martian surface, we could build a base and perhaps actually establish a colony to live there. Could we actually build planes that would fly through Martian air? Probably not. The Martian air is very, very thin. The air pressure on Mars is less than 1 100th of the air pressure on Earth. So the airplanes won't work. Everything will have to be conducted by rockets. But there are serious plans to visit Mars. This is how Mars was envisioned in the 1950s. This is how we envision Mars today. There's a lot more dust in the atmosphere than we thought of. And the reason is fairly simple. On Earth, water condenses around dust particles. And that removes the dust from the atmosphere and brings it down to the surface. On Mars, we have a dry planet where there is very little water and no liquid water at all. So therefore, dust remains in the atmosphere. The dust is like talcum powder. It's relentless and even the slightest winds carry it. So Mars turns out to be relatively dusty. We will someday go to Mars. So here we are. When will we go? Well, as it turns out, when we look at these oppositions of Mars, remember every two years and two months we have one. This was one two years ago. This is the current one. Notice we have to wait a long time for another close opposition. That occurs in the early 1930s. So Elon Musk would seriously like to visit Mars in the early 1930s. Our two planets, Earth and Mars, are favorably placed for a shorter travel time in the early 1930s. So here we are. We look into our night sky, and we realize that we live in stormy times. Uh, definitely, these are uneasy times on Earth. But yet, the night sky is with us. We have plenty of time to observe it. And even though we live in the COVID-19 era, even though things look stormy, remember, there's something inspiring. No matter how things might be on Earth, even if the economy is down, you can always look up. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, everyone at home, for being a part of the art. We now open the time up for questions from our theater audience, as well as our online audience. Ron, if you'll be so kind as to repeat the questions for our viewers. I will do that. Let's start the Q&A, and I will start it off with a question from home from Bonnie Head. Do they know why Mars' orbit is oval-shaped? Well, actually, every planet is oval-shaped. Uh, the uh, the uh, astronomers have realized a long time that uh, all orbits are basically ellipses. And a circle is really a special case ellipse with an eccentricity of zero. Uh, that means that we keep a constant distance from the center of the orbit. Uh, but all planets have elliptical orbits. Venus is the most circular of all. The Earth's orbit varies from a distance of about 91.5 million miles to 94 and a half million miles. Mars has a much more exaggerated ellipse. And there are two other planets that are more elliptical than Mars. And that is Mercury and Pluto. Of course, now we call Pluto a dwarf planet. But nonetheless, uh, really, the question is, why is Mars a little bit more elliptical than many of the other planets? It has to probably do with interactions with other planets in the solar system. We know from studies on Earth, based on past climates, that the Earth's orbit has varied from nearly circular to being more elliptical like Mars. So the tugging effects of the gravity of Jupiter and Earth have a profound effect on the shape of Mars's orbit. And it does change very slowly over time, as the Earth will change. The most stable orbits in the solar system would be Jupiter and Saturn. They are large. They're less influenced by other bodies. Other questions? Sure. Uh, do Venus and the Earth also have bands that are just smaller? OK. OK, the question is, do Venus and the Earth have cloud bands uh, like we see on Jupiter and Saturn? And the answer is yes. Uh, when we observed the planet Venus and photographed it in ultraviolet light from space, we saw a structure in those clouds in the upper atmosphere. And we did see bands. Now, as far as the Earth, the Earth might be a little bit more like Jupiter than we realize. Okay? Uh, if you live about 25 degrees north or south of the equator, you live in an area uh, that tends to be desert-like. Australia lies at this latitude. Uh, so does uh, uh, parts of Argentina and uh, Paraguay, the northern parts over there. But particularly Chile on the west side is very dry. Uh, southern Africa lies at this latitude, and it's fairly dry. And in the northern hemisphere, the Sahara Desert at this latitude, the southwest of the United States. And if we could fill up the Gulf of Mexico and get rid of all that water, why, uh, the East Coast would be dry, too. So we're very lucky for that body of water. Uh, so there is a tendency for deserts to exist at this latitude. Well, let's picture the Earth. And where on the Earth will we get the most solar heating? And the answer is the equator. And hot water evaporates and rises. And it forms clouds constantly along the equator. So most areas along the equator get constant rainfall all year round. Now, hot air rises. And as the hot air rises, it wants to cool and descend. But it can't descend over a rising column of air. It gets pushed off to the side and descends. And that descending column of air is going to be drying, because when air moves downward, it's compressed by gravity. Energy is added to it. And that evaporates water and heats the air. So that's why we have clear spots on the Earth at latitudes of 25 to 30 degrees from the equator. We have clouds on the Earth at the equator itself. And those banding structures of Jupiter seem to mimic that same behavior. OK? Sure. Satellites? I hope not. No, they're not, actually. It looks, looks, looks like a, a US company is going to be doing this, Starlink. Uh, Elon Musk is launching the satellites. He's not building them. OK. Uh, 
first of all, there are several uh, orbits where we cluster a lot of satellites together. You mentioned, or the, I should repeat the question, uh, what about all these satellites being launched by Elon Musk? Are other countries like China and Russia launching them? And the answer is no. Uh, where are these satellites? Well, one particular place is what we call geosynchronous orbits. If you're at about 23,000 miles above the Earth's surface, the orbital period of a satellite equals the rotation period of Earth. So it seems to hover over the same location of Earth. And many of our communication satellites are in that position. This new network of satellites will not be at that location. They're going to be in low Earth orbit at about 200 miles above the Earth's surface. Now, why are we launching low Earth orbiting satellites? The power requirements for transmission and reception for high-speed internet connection at an orbit, a distance of 23,000 miles is just too vast. So we have to bring the satellites closer. Now, think about your cell phones for a second. When you travel on the freeway, you will be out of range of one cell tower, and then you're automatically transferred to the next cell tower. Now, this grid of satellites is going to do effectively the same thing, except you're not moving, the satellites are. So one satellite will be orbiting over you, and as it moves out of range, the next satellite comes in. So that's why we need like 10,000 of them, because we have to have a lot of them all over, and they have to be just above the Earth's atmosphere. So that's the Starlink program. And since they're in low Earth orbit, there's less volume of space, and we have a lot of satellites in roughly the same position. So the collision thing probably won't happen. The collision avoidance system that they have should work, but it is a mild cause for concern. Sure. I don't believe in guns. Uh, no. I <laughs> <laughs> the question is, you didn't mention anything about shooting stars. Okay. <laughs> okay, shooting stars are the results of collisions. Uh, we know that space is not a complete void, and space is filled with tiny particles of dust. As the Earth moves through space, and as particles of dust move through space, inevitably collisions will occur. A small particle of dust, maybe something equal to an ash of a cigarette, okay, that will pass through the Earth's atmosphere at high speeds. Those high speeds will cause frictional heat. The frictional heat will ionize the air. It will literally make the air glow like a fluorescent light bulb, but only for a brief second or two. And the particle, if it's small, will be completely consumed by the heat of friction. So that little streak of light that you see is really not the particle, but the ionized trail of air, the excited air, just like in a neon light bulb, that's left behind as a result of the energy dissipated when the particle gets consumed. Now, it takes a, a more rugged, substantial particle to make its way uh, to the Earth's surface. But something even the, the size of a grain of sand, denser, larger, more massive, it will produce something bright like a fireball. This would be a meteor so bright that it would cast a shadow at night and you'd turn around and still be able to see it. And you might even see it during the daytime. Those are very rare because most people aren't looking at the sky during the daytime. And a meteor has to be very bright to be seen during the daytime. Now, many tons of material fall to Earth every day. Uh, so there, these things are going on all the time. But fortunately, large particles are relatively rare. Uh, we had one uh, move across Siberia, and uh, it knocked out windows from uh, the... Uh, uh, basically, it produced sonic waves as it moved through the Earth's atmosphere. It was faster than the speed of sound. And uh, the compression of the atmosphere uh, knocked building windows out, uh, and uh, it was almost felt like an earthquake to people there. Uh, that had is actually about the same release of energy as a two, tilo, two kiloton nuclear weapon, a little smaller than the Hiroshima weapon. But that's pretty substantial. Uh, probably one of these happens every year. 
but most of the earth is over water, so we don't observe it. And much of it is over remote areas, over the North Pole, over the South Pole, over the Sahara Desert, and so they're not observed. But about every five or six years, we get a pretty substantial uh, fireball, a meteor. Uh, sometimes you can hear anomalous sounds from it, and they're bright enough to be seen in daytime. Only rarely uh, is one made of solid enough material that the material survives through the Earth's atmosphere and lands on the Earth as a meteorite. And uh, that happens about, uh, oh, about every 10 years or so, we get an observed fall of a meteorite, and the meteorites are actually picked up, which is actually material from outer space. If you go to a museum, they often have meteorites on display, and the question obviously is, are they made of the same stuff we find on Earth? And the answer is yes. Uh, the ratios of minerals and elements may be different, but it's still the same stuff. Other questions? There is a question from a viewer. Why is there just a ring around Saturn rather than having it totally enveloped or envelop the planet? The uh, orbit of the object that Roche's limit and Saturn's tidal forces broke up is on an orbital plane. And anything in motion will tend to stay in that same plane of motion. And so they'll be distributed along the plane of motion of the object that collided with Saturn. Later on, uh, the moons of Saturn will tend to orient the ring particles on the same plane that these moons are. So uh, the rings of Saturn have probably been around for a long, long time. And there, there is a certain stability to them that suggests that. And uh, that's why they exist on one plane, because they're going to lie in the same plane as the orbit of the object that collided with Saturn. If that orbital plane was different than the moon's, over time, the orbital plane will gradually be oriented toward the orbital planes of the large moons of Saturn. By the way, Saturn is kind of a solar system. So is Jupiter. Uh, they have satellites that we think formed around them as these planets formed early in the creation of the solar system. So when you look at Uranus and Neptune and Jupiter and Saturn, you're kind of looking at stars that failed. Uh, they were large bodies of space, and as these large bodies formed, smaller bodies, uh, little vortices of clouds that were separated from the main one, coalesced to form smaller bodies, and those are the moons of these planets. So Jupiter and Saturn, with its moon system, is analogous to the sun with its planetary system. Are there any other questions? Are there any other questions? Sure, one in the audience here. Well, I was, uh, I, I don't know whether we talked about this before or not, but farmers on Earth uh, always conduct on a daily basis what's called the, uh, the pan evaporation experiment. And all it is is like a pie tin filled with water, and they measure the rate at which it evaporates. And what we found is after 9-11, the evaporation rate changed because air flights were grounded and less particulate matter was in the upper atmosphere. Now we're finding the same thing happening all over again, except this is for a longer period of time. So we're actually finding that there is a greater evaporation of water uh, because we're not producing clouds that are reflecting sunlight back into the Earth's upper atmosphere. So yeah, it will subtly change the Earth's climate. Uh, but uh, as far as the Chinese and the Indians are concerned, the welcome thing about this is they are just rife with air pollution. Uh, they burn a lot of coal, which is, of course, dirty. They're not so-called clean coal technology. And uh, they're producing a lot of particulate matter in the atmosphere, and now that's being removed. So it's good for our lungs. It's good for looking up in the sky. And uh, as long as this is going on for a while, Breathe deeply and enjoy, but six feet away from everybody else. <laughs>
Any other questions? Thank you for watching this Voyager lecture. Please like and share our page so that we can be a global voice for science and the arts in this new age of online connectivity. Announcements of upcoming live events may come just a few days in advance. This Saturday at 6 p.m., we're featuring the Ferguson family of St. George with an hour-long concert of well-known and other classical pieces. And then at 7, bluegrass-inspired multi-instrumentalist John Stone will be streaming in from his home. You can support our endeavors by visiting knntoarts.com slash donate. But whether you can donate at this time or not, you are already supporting us. Thank you for being a part of the art.